seismic waves of change. Here's Steve Denning in Forbes magazine. He writes about the leadership in the three-speed economy. You guys, take a look at this. Why do we need to reimagine partnerships going forward between distributors and manufacturers? Well, according to Steve Denning, he says, for the first time in human history, for the first time in human history, three economies are clashing. Bam! Three economies are colliding. Bam! And, and if we're really honest with each other, this traditional economy, financial capitalism, uh, the creative economy, if we're really honest with each other, nobody in this room really knows that when these three economies, for the first time in human history, come colliding together, if we're really honest, we don't know how it's going to end up. So, for example, the traditional economy, that's what you and I know. That's what we've built our careers on. Uh, we, we, we partner with the manufacturers who, who, who manufacture the switch or the lighting or the gear, whatever it is. We partner with them, we can put them on our shelf, we go out, we sell it to the marketplace. It's traditional, man. If business remained that way, holy cow, we wouldn't have to be here. Be okay. We know how to manage a business and lead a business in that environment. We've done it. But what Steve Denning tells us is that traditional economy is colliding with financial capitalism. Bam. Now, what's financial capitalism? You guys, that's what's happening on Wall Street, right? That's where, where the power base is in the hands of not the many, but a very few. It's where wealth is being created, not by the many, but concentrated in the hands of few. It's where individuals, they're not creating, are, are you kidding me? They're, they go, go and look at their plant. They're not building anything. They're not creating anything. They're creating these financial instruments that some believe are almost like a house of cards. And, and, and just one rogue trader might make a decision that could collapse entire what? You guys are out there working in the home building industry, industrial, whatever it happens to be. One rogue trader decides to do something and could, are, are, are you with me? Could collapse the entire market that you guys have put your love, breath, blood, sweat, and tears into. I mean, back uh, in April of last year, I was down in... Uh, um, Fort Lauderdale, and I did a presentation. I was getting on the airplane. I'm going through the airport. It's from April 23rd. And, and the headline of the USA Today caught my attention. Traders arrest spooked investors. Now, guys, they get $2 for a USA Today. So rather than buying it, I took a picture of it with my iPhone, all right? And that's what you see up there. But look, don't look at the headline. You guys know Mark Cuban, right? We all know Mark Cuban's shark taking off. Look what he says. He says, if a guy in his underwear can manipulate markets... Anybody can. You know what he's telling us? You and I are working together as partners, working our tails off, doing everything that we know how to do, and some guy in his underwear can collapse markets at a push of a button. We live in the age of disruption. We live in the age we are managing and leading our businesses in this new age of disruption. Now, the third economy, right? First time ever. There's the traditional, there's the financial, and then there's this creative economy. Now, guys, what's the creative economy? The creative economy says that there's some 18-year-old kid um, over in, 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 say, Bangalore, India. Or there's an 18-year-old kid in Bend, Oregon. I don't know where. And this 18-year-old kid hasn't been out of his grandmother's basement in the last three months. He's got Domino's pizza boxes piled up. He's got Red Bull cans piled up. Like This kid hasn't showered in three freaking months. But what does he have in front of him? What does he have in front of him, anybody? And what's he doing with that computer, you guys? He's putting ones and zeros together. And this kid hasn't showered in three months. He's putting ones and zeros together. He's coding. He's creating new models, new applications, entire new business, entire new markets that's disrupting just about every market on the planet. Would you agree? 18-year-old kid. Guys, I, um, I'm a huge Apple fan. I've never owned a PC in my life. Um, uh, uh, everything I own is Apple. Always has been. Always will be. But I'm an Apple fan. Now, I'm not a coder. But you know, every June, Apple has their Worldwide Developers Conference. Every June, they, they bring all the developers from around the world 
into San Francisco to learn about the new operating system so that they can code, and can I use Apple's words? So they can come together to change the world. This is a screenshot. This is a screenshot from Apple's Worldwide Developer Console Conference where they're recruiting developers to come in. Take a look at who they are recruiting to come in and disrupt your business, to disrupt your market. January 4th, I was with a group, uh, a, a, an electrical slash plumbing distributor for their national sales meeting, 120 salespeople out there. 120 salespeople out there in the room. I'm about ready to do a half a day sales workshop with them in this age of disruption, just two weeks ago. Before they started, the VP of sales and marketing had everybody stand up, because there were some acquisitions, had everybody stand up, introduce themselves, where they're from, and how many what? Years experience they had in the industry. It came out to 3,661 years of experience in that industry, amazing. But you know what's even more amazing to me? Apple didn't recruit one of them to come. Apple said that there was a 13 year old somewhere in the world who's looking at the world differently than the years of experience you and I have in this room. They're saying there's a 17 year old kid who understands technology better than you and I. They understand, they, they, they're telling me that these kids go to college and in high school now and all of their work is done in teams and in groups and with collaboration. And we need individuals, 13, 17 year olds, who know how to put their ego aside and learn how to work together for the good of everybody. I don't know, that's what they're saying. We live in the age of disruption. The reality is, God, partnering sounds so easy. Let's get together, let's develop strategies. But the reality is the world is completely different than it was just a little bit ago. So there are some of the market trends that says why we need to reimagine partnerships going forward. You know, let's look at some of the market dynamics. Now let's, let's bring it up a little bit, or let's go down from 30,000 foot to about 10,000 foot. What you and I find ourselves in the electrical distribution market every single day of our lives, right? And, and, and here's what Mike Kelch from French, he, he said to me, he said, Dirk, we have to understand that there are a gazillion moving parts. Of course, partnering sounds so simple, but the complexity comes in because there's thousands of moving parts. And these moving parts create complexity that you and I have to find a way to break through if we're going to reimagine partnerships. I mean, just take a look at some of the partnerships. It sounds so easy to say, let's partner together. But then there's historical relationships. My God, I've had a relationship with this organization, with this person for years. Over here, there might be another opportunity, but I feel loyal to somebody over here. Does that make sense? But in reality, the opportunity over here might be better. It adds complexity. We have personalities. Some people we get along with, some people we don't get along with. There's the intensity and flow of information that's driving change. There's the rapid technology, we alluded to it. There's consolidations, there's mergers and acquisitions, both on the manufacturer side and the distributor side. It's all adding complexity. You, you know, there's the number of lines that distributors carry. I think I'll allude to it once or twice today, where manufacturers say, you know what, the distributors have got to make a decision. Are they going to partner or are they going to be all things to everybody? Can you guess what the distributors say about manufacturers? Same damn thing. Right, number of distributors representing manufacturer. Direct sales versus rep agency. Again, level of complexity. Who's going to be able to partner better? I don't know. We've got buying groups in the middle of this. We've got the turnover of personnel that I've had relationships with over the years. We've got the structure. I, you know what, the partnering with a family owned organization, a public organization, an ESOP, is going to be different. They have different mindsets potentially about partnering. We all each have our own goals. We're aligned in one market, but not the other. Special pricing agreements, lack of technology standards across the, organization, the industry, there's customer preferences that we have, and there's more. So yeah, it makes so much sense, let's partner. But the fact is we've got to put on the table the complexities are making it tougher and tougher. And simply getting around the campfire singing kumbaya, saying let's come together, let's partner, let's go have a drink together, let's go play a round of golf together, it ain't 
going to work going forward. It ain't going to work going forward. So some of the market, some of the specific market dynamics that, we, that came out of this research, if you will. One, I think we need to begin asking ourselves technology. We know we're in the digital age. Do we have a view that technology is a friend of ours? Or do we think it's our enemy? Two different thought processes are gonna drive two different ways to partner going forward. Here's what one individual said to me. He said, Dirk, we know the risks. There are competitive channels that are much more developed and evolved in the use of those technologies. So we might feel threatened, but we could choose to do the same thing. And there are some folks that have definitely done that. Are we feeling threatened by technology? Or is it an opportunity that we're gonna go all in? Next, we know our customers' preferences and the requirements are changing, and it seems like almost overnight. Here's what Howie told me. He said, Dirk, we see that the end user's requirements and expectations are changing rapidly. How do we accelerate? How do we get ahead of this? When some of those 120 salespeople that I was with the other day, they're afraid of this. Rather than embracing it, how do we get ahead of it? Number three, intensified competition. We're all feeling this, aren't we, throughout the industry? Everyone continues to get better and you have to differentiate yourself. Everyone is continuing to get better and we have to differentiate yourself. You can't be the same guy and rely on your personality as in the past. You need to shift and make sure your customers understand why you're different. You need to shift and understand why you're different. Your customers need to understand. Hey, I see some of you trying to take pictures. I encourage it. But also, just so you know, on the back of here is a link. You're going to be able to download as soon as you get out of here every one of these slides, okay? They're gonna be there for you. Uh, number four, I think, right? Alternative channels. Man, it was great when we were the only game in town. It was amazing when there was no such thing as e-commerce. It was amazing. Uh, um, here's what Paul told me. He said, Dirk, I think we need each other now more than ever because there are just so many different ways to buy the exact same widget. Guys, as we were going through this uh, research, Scott Costa of TED Magazine and, and, and his team was doing some other research. And as we looked at what we were both looking at, this stood out to me from, from Scott and TED Magazine's research. He, he, look, he asked the industry, in the next five years, do you believe there will be a significant increase in manufacturers using e-commerce, come on, to sell directly to the end user? He's asking the manufacturers that belong to NAED. And he's asking the distributors that belong to NAED that question. Would anybody care to guess what percentage of distributors believe their, let's put them in quotes, their partners over the next five years are going to look to significantly go around their partners and sell directly to the end user? Anybody care to put a number out there? Throw it out. No right, no wrong. Throw it out. 50, 60, yeah. 60% of distributors believe that's happening. All right, manufacturing, do you think the number was more or less than 60%? 69% of our partners are saying they're going to find a way to go directly to the end user. We need to reimagine our partnerships. There is intensified in different channels. Next. Here's one that came out. I think we'll allude to it once or twice more. But one of the things that came to this is, came out of this research that, that, that hit me over the head is serving existing markets has been commoditized. I, I, I mean, look, uh, we all are after the same customers. We all have the same products on the shelves. We've all gone through lean processes. We all have unbelievable fill rates and fill capacities. We all do. And if we all do, it suggests we've been commoditized. It suggests we've got to innovate beyond that. One VP told me, Dirk, if someone is just going to you because they need a breaker or two, and that breaker every other week or one who needs it four times a day, you can easily optimize for that. That's no longer a viable value proposition because it's easy to do. 
I think we should put easy in parentheses, huh, or, or quotes.